We have a few more people trickling in and then I will start very shortly. Amazing. All right. Well, uh, again, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited for this panel and extremely excited to see all of you. Um, loving all the responses coming in. And yes, we do have a big Connecticut contingency, very east, uh, east coast of the US today. Um, again, um, Today, uh, you know, we will be having a wonderful experience of listening to this incredible panel. Um, I wanted to quickly introduce uh, some of the planning team before passing it over to our moderator. Um, so my name is Winnie. I am an MPH, uh, so Master of Public Health graduate student that's been working on uh, this panel and with the HIV and humanitarian crisis team over at CIRA. And uh, I will quickly pass this over to the other assistant, Dina, as well. Uh, just a quick reminder, during the panel, we ask that you please keep your mics muted. Uh, this panel is being recorded, so please note that if you choose to turn your camera on. We would love to see your faces. Um, please keep all questions until the end. We do have a designated open Q&A time, which we absolutely encourage you to put questions early in the chat box. We encourage you to turn your cameras on and ask them um, live to our panelists and our moderator. But we're really hoping to get a really great conversation going today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dina. Hi everyone, I'm Dina. I'm a second year undergraduate student assistant who's been helping out with this event. And I would love if you guys would please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Kaveh Khushman. Um, he is an associate professor of epidemiology and director of undergraduate studies at the Yale School of Public Health. He's also executive committee member at the Yale Council on Middle East Studies and with more than three decades of domestic and international experience in HIV prevention research among at-risk populations. He currently heads the Humanitarian Research Lab which researches and addresses humanitarian crises across the world. And his research interests include the epidemiology of and prevention of HIV AIDS, research ethics, and humanitarian health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dina. And thank you, Mini, and thank you, Dini. We have uh, a lot of uh, folks helping us with this panel. As Dina mentioned, I've been involved in HIV AIDS for a couple of decades, and including uh, having the pleasure of working with CIRA, our Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS. But I think like the ethical aspect of our work has been somewhat uh, neglected and I'm uh, delighted that we decided to have this symposium today. We have an incredible group of panelists who have been involved in HIV AIDS work, both on the practice side, policy side and research side. And I'd like to in briefly introduce them um, before we get started. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Chris Cole, Christopher Cole. Chris has served as the executive director of APNH, which used to be uh, called AIDS Project New Haven, and now it's a place to nourish your health. Um, Chris has been executive director since 2008. He's the co-chair of the New Haven Fairfield County EMA Ryan White Planning Council. He's on the CIRA. Um, Community Advisory Board and Executive Committee member, and he's a person living with HIV. Next, we have Joanna Ellum, who is an instructor in general internal medicine at Yale, core faculty of the Center for Health and Justice at the Yale School of Medicine, and part of the Office of Diversity, <clears throat> Equity and Inclusion in Internal Medicine. After finishing her doctoral degree, she completed fellowships with the program to increase diversity in behavioral medicine and sleep disorder research at the NYU School of Medicine um, <clears throat> and the Lifespan Brown Criminal Justice Program training program on substance use, HIV and comorbidities and the NIMH HIV prevention training program at CIRA. 
She has led a number of projects, including Women on Road to Health, Transitions, and Evidence-Based Group Intervention for Women Recently Released from Incarceration with a focus on HIV prevention. And our third panelist is Dr. Jennifer Moots at Columbia University. Dr. Moots is a licensed psychologist, assistant professor of clinical, medicine, clinical medical psychology in the psychiatry department at Columbia University, research scientist at the Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene, New York State Psychi Psychiatric Institute. She earned, she earned her PhD in counseling psychology from Texas Women's University in 2015. Her NIMH-funded research has focused on reducing the global mental health and substance use treatment gap in low-income and humanitarian settings internationally and in the United States through digitized innovations and considerations of social determinants. She has partnered with community and governmental agencies to conduct research on implementation of comprehensive mental health care scale-up services. To get the um, discussion started, I, I gave a brief introduction to the panelists, but you don't really have a good sense of the work that they've been doing. So I'm gonna ask them to uh, tell us a little bit about their work related to HIV AIDS and other uh, related issues such as mental health and substance use. And just to get started, um, when we think about ethics, uh, it's kind of a, the big picture is doing the right thing, but that's a very broad um, kind of aspect of it. So I'm curious if you could tell us when you hear the word ethics, in your work, what kind of comes to, to mind? What does it mean to you? Just as a way to get it started. So again, if you could just start by telling us a little bit more about your work, how you got interested in working on HIV AIDS and related topics. And when you think of ethics, what kind of comes to your mind? And I'll start with Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, so at APNH, A Place to Nourish Your Health, we are an AIDS service organization that has expanded our, our mission to provide culturally competent care to uh, folks who face stigma in receiving that care. The bulk of our work is still in uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, we do medical case management, mental health, uh, substance use treatment, uh, home meal delivery program, uh, HIV and STI testing, um, education, um, and uh, support services like emergency financial assistance, transportation, that sort of thing. So that's the, the bulk of the, the work that we do. When I think of um, ethics, I, I think of... Um, you know, Kavi said it, you know, doing the right thing, but are we, are we meeting all of the needs of our clients to ensure that they have the best health outcomes in a way that is um, culturally competent, but, but really takes into a consideration the individual needs and nuances of the people that we're serving. Um, and, you know, we are often tasked by our funders at the state and federal uh, level to focus on particular populations. And I, I think ethically, we look at how do we, uh, how do we do that in a way that is meeting their needs without coming across as almost predators in those communities? How do we do that in an authentic way? And so I, I guess the word that I would use around ethics for us is authenticity. How do we authentically do that in a way that um, is, is really helping the person uh, and not just imposing on them what we think the solutions are? Thank you, Chris. I'll turn it over to Joanna. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm faculty here at the SAGE Center for Health and Justice here at Yale, and our work is really focused on the health of people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system and mass incarceration. And so that work takes on many forms. Um, we do do research at the center, 
is one of our main focuses, but we also have an arm that provides clinical care. Uh, and we're part of the Transitions Clinic Network, which provides medical care to people coming out of prison across the country uh, and uh, across the United States and in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, so we're providing clinical care as well as doing research. And then we have uh, a good portion of our work is also devoted to advocacy for this population and ensuring that uh, their needs and health needs and um, that their human rights are being met. Uh, and so I think Chris summed it up really well, what ethics is, but I think uh, for us and some of our primary mission is ensuring that uh, people who are incarcerated or recently released uh, are treated with dignity and respect and that their health needs are being met regardless of what they're accused of doing. Thank you, Joanna. Um, Jen? Good morning, everyone. I am a clinical researcher, and I work with internally displaced populations, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, some in South America. Um, but there's a lot of variability with these populations. So I can give two examples. One, uh, in Uganda, we have uh, internally displaced people in quite a remote setting. So this is a population that is highly marginalized and has endured armed conflict for decades, I would say. Um, people live in what are called protectorate villages. So the government soldiers are there um, to protect them, but they also bring in some risk for HIV, which maybe we'll get into later. Uh, another setting is in Mozambique in a, an urban setting. So we're working in Nampula city, which has about a million people living there and directly north in a province um, called Cabo Delgado, there is a religious insurgency that's taking place and has displaced hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom have relocated to Nampula. So these, uh, it's a very different sort of setting and structure all sorts of different implications for ethics, I think, and doing ethical research and practice. Um, uh, there's less visibility for people who move to urban settings. So often they're absorbed by family members, maybe fewer resources allocated for them uh, and those kinds of things. So I did not start as an HIV researcher. My work started in, in interest in uh, gender-based violence and exposure to armed conflict. And I do qualitative research. So when we first started uh, asking questions through focus groups and interviews, we asked very open-ended questions about exposure to armed conflict and how that might intersect with gender-based violence. Uh, and through this, HIV was named. I'm sure people on this, um, in this room won't be surprised to hear that. So HIV was talked about in terms of sexual assault that happened during the raids. HIV was talked about and as a component of violence in the home and discordance in, among couples. So now I am interested in doing HIV research. Um, Kave likes to start with the big question. So thinking about ethics uh, and what that means. As the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is safety. So that's a part of do no harm. Um, but also as the other panelists are saying, just thinking about, um, power structures in research and especially um, my coming from a high income setting and working with displaced populations in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, thinking about participation and how important that is with the communities with whom we're working. Because ethics, we can try to act ethically, but can make some really serious mistakes if um, we may have some blind spots coming from an, as an outsider. So just paying attention to power and those dynamics um, and how they might play out in relationships. Thank you, that was, a, that was a great opening remarks. So, you know, the title of this panel is Ethics of HIV AIDS Research and Practice Among Vulnerable Populations Impacted by Humanitarian Crisis. Uh, when we think of humanitarian crisis for this panel, we are not exclusively thinking about individuals at risk for HIV or living with HIV AIDS who are impacted by armed conflict. Let's say what's happening in Ukraine right now. We have people living with HIV AIDS who are losing access to 
healthcare providers, treatment, et cetera, they're being displaced. Same thing has been going on in many parts of Africa. Uh, Uganda was mentioned, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Northern Ethiopia, et cetera. So this is definitely something that's going on. But, but unfortunately, in addition to those individuals, we have also other individuals whose lives have been impacted by natural disasters, by floods, by hurricanes, and that includes people in the United States, things that happen in New Orleans, what happened in Puerto Rico. Uh, and then natural disasters have been expanded throughout the world. So we're gonna have many, many more people who are gonna be impacted by a range of armed conflict, natural disasters. And then we have uh, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, incarcerated populations that Joanna mentioned. Um, so these individuals, um, are highly vulnerable. And if we are trying to provide HIV services and care to them, uh, help them improve, get access to testing, treatment, if you're trying to conduct research with them to understand what their needs are, um, there must be some particular ethical challenges that come up that maybe it's similar to uh, people who are not so much affected by these different kinds of crises, or maybe there's somewhat unique. Uh, so I would really be interested in, can give us some examples. Um, you all have worked with different populations and I'm curious, uh, are there particular ethical issues that you've encountered in your work with these highly vulnerable populations? And maybe I can start with Chris again. Um, are there examples of people uh, in the United States who are, let's say, asylum seekers. They are undocumented. Maybe they were recently released from prison, which maybe Joanna can talk about. And when you're trying to provide them the services that APNH offers, are there particular challenges that, yes, you want to do the right thing, but you may have uh, limitations uh, that are imposed on you? How, can you give us an example of that and how do you cope with that situation? Yeah, so um, I would, and I'm not going to talk about this right now, but I would expand humanitarian crisis um, to uh, the inequality of, especially in violence, that uh, young Black men in our communities face as well um, in general. But uh, as far as um, an example, we had a uh, we have a family that we work with who are um, undocumented, uh, living in New Haven, uh, mom and dad and six kids, and we've been able to get them on um, connected to the medical system uh, through our Ryan White funding. It took us about a year and a half to get them housing. Um, you know, we, we had them housed temporarily in a, in a church for a while. We had them, you know, and, and to keep mom and dad on antiretroviral therapy and keep their health up without housing, without the basic necessities of food and housing that um, are really difficult for us to access for folks who are undocumented. Fortunately, in the Ryan White world, we're able to provide medical services, but we aren't able to get them some of their other basic needs met. And, um, and, and that becomes really difficult. You know, how do we, how do we treat someone um, and, and keep them connected to care when they don't have a place to live, especially when they have six children. Um, so that, that's, I think, the primary example I would use in um, an undocumented population of, of folks that we work with. We work with, you know, many individuals, not as many families, um, but that family really sticks out as a primary example that has been a real challenge for us to, to keep them engaged in, in services and um, really uh, time intensive, which, which we love because that's the work that we do. That's what we thrive on, but it's, um, that's been a real challenge. Thanks, Chris. I'll turn it to Joanna. I know you've worked with uh, 
incarcerated population and those who are recently released, are there particular ethical challenges that come up with that population? If you can give us an example of that, that would be great. I think one of the major challenges that we face in our work is that um, we, in addition to working with people who are incarcerated and having people on our team who have a history of incarceration, um, and many of us uh, also have some direct connection to incarceration, um, we also partner with Department of Corrections. We have to work with probation and parole when working with participants and patients. And that often brings up a, an ethical conflict where um, what we feel is best for the patient is not, uh, is in conflict maybe with what DOC or with what probation and parole feels should happen with this person. And so um, one particular example, we had a person who was working pretty closely with us he was rearrested, um, but he had lots of health issues. And so for us, it was a real concern for him to go back inside. So we spent a lot of time doing advocacy around trying to get some type of alternative to incarceration for him, uh, which is not typically an area that we delve into all the time. But in this particular case, um, it was someone who had worked with our team, and so we felt really strongly that we needed to advocate for him um, and actually were able to get a good outcome for him in, in many ways. Um, but those are some of the big challenges that we face, I think, is maintaining those partnerships while at the same time ensuring that the, our patients and participants get the best outcome for them, which may be in conflict with those other systems. Thank you. And Jen, are there particular ethical issues when you're doing research with populations you mentioned in northern in North Uganda and parts of Mozambique who have been affected by armed conflict and also I, I'm guessing also natural disasters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I can, when you asked that question, I thought about when I first um, went to Uganda. So we would travel during the day to the villages where we were working um, that would mostly experience conflict during the evening. So we would kind of come during the day and then go back to a nearby town. And one day as we were getting ready to leave, we had wrapped up our focus groups and we're leaving the villages and we heard a gunshot um, coming from the barracks of the soldiers. So we left and came back the next day and found out that um, a soldier I think a woman had disclosed her status to a soldier who was her boyfriend uh, who shot and killed her. So this is my first time in the field and this made quite an impression, obviously. Um, so when I think about this, I think about you know, violence against women and um, we're talking about intersections of vulnerabilities. So I think about gender and also women who might be widowed or um, impoverished and not have a means for economic livelihood. So the, these are the, we have to be very careful about, um, especially around disclosure of status. And that could be from a research perspective, that could be a partner even suspecting disclosure. So we're very careful when doing um, surveys, for example, or interviews with women who have been exposed to violence um, and who are talking about HIV status because uh, we try to you know, mask the, the surveys and the purpose of the surveys uh, on recommendations of the World Health Organization, because if a partner suspects that a woman might be talking about these things that are considered private, then she could be in real danger. So those are the issues that are particular to the settings where I'm working. Thank you for sharing that. Um... I mean, that's really challenging to, to be on the ground and see kind of a violent uh, thing happen right in, literally in, in front of you. And what brings to mind is this notion of moral distress or sometimes they refer to as moral injury where um, healthcare workers, humanitarian workers on the front line often face all sorts of really tough decisions they have to make. They have limited resources, li limited capacity, and there's so many people 
who need support services and frankly, they're not able to do that. They have to make really difficult decisions about who to prioritize, et cetera. So um, moral distress is something that I think is linked to the ethical issues, meaning you want to do the right thing, but uh, you don't have the resources, they don't have the capacity, or <clears throat> you wanna, for example, I'm thinking of a colleague who was telling me he wanted to offer methadone treatment to an incarcerated individual who was on methadone before being incarcerated. Now that he was incarcerated, my colleague who's a clinician wanted to provide methadone and the prison system would not allow him to do that. So he was just feeling uh, very uncomfortable with that and he sort of, it was a big challenge. So I'm just curious, uh, is moral distress or is something you guys have encountered and how do you prepare yourself uh, in terms of self-care, making sure it doesn't bother you, you can still move on forward. Anybody wants to respond to that, I appreciate it. I can uh, say a little bit about that. So uh, because we work a lot with Department of Corrections, that isn't with the, front, the issue that your colleague pointed out, it comes up often in our work where, um, especially for providers who are inside facilities, that they're often in some ways really restricted in terms of what they're able to do because of policies, but also sometimes just because of the environment um, in correctional facilities. And it creates a huge issue for our, our participants and patients as well, because often they, um, may feel distrustful of the provider because just for the simple fact that they're part of that setting that is um, oppressing them and um, is often denying them some of their basic human rights and needs. So um, that's, I think, a huge challenge, especially for providers on the inside. And I think we really have to um, try to provide more support for them and also ensure that they have the ability to really provide the care that they wanna provide in those settings without the restrictions of uh, Department of Corrections. Thank you. Chris or Jen, this idea of moral distress, um, wanting to do the right thing and not being able to do it, is that something that comes up in your work? And if yes, is there any training? Is there any way to prepare for this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was sort of thinking about it from the research perspective because um, you know we have a research team who will go into the field often and ask all of these sensitive questions uh, and really heavy questions about exposure to armed conflict, various types of exposure, exposure to violence in the home, um, mental health struggles, HIV status and struggles. Um, so we often build into the research process some debriefing time um, because uh, in addition to perhaps moral distress, uh, the idea of the research surveys is not necessarily to respond right then. So it's collecting all of this information and not really having anything to do with it, uh, at least in the immediate sense. So we build in to all of our research some debriefing time where the research team can talk about what they're hearing and how it's affected them. Um, and then we also build into the research process some time for dissemination and working with the community to make sure that we have that action component and people aren't just left you know, with um, having heard a lot of hard information and not really feeling like they're able to do anything with that. Yeah, and I would, you know, one of the tools that we use, and it's mostly our, our frontline staff, our medical case managers that uh, face this much more than I do in a more administrative role, and um, clinical supervision and, and time for them, for our case managers to talk through um, the challenges and concerns that they have is something that we've built into uh, our support of them in how they're getting the support to to deal with those challenges and and um, 
think that's what I have to add to that. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I'm sort of curious about funders, funders for research, funders for um, HIV AIDS practice, et cetera. Is ethics is something that they pay attention to? Do they, um, do they offer uh, training? Do they say, oh, you need to, we're gonna set aside some budget for you to make sure you and your staff are properly trained for this? I mean, as a researcher, I know that there is an obligation for all of us to go through online training. It's usually kind of a 30, 40 minute training in human subject research, just to anticipate the kinds of ethical issues may come up in our work. And it's a very broad training. Again, it's usually done online. You get a little certificate and then you can move forward. That's basically it. Um, on the practice side, I don't know if you get funding from CDC or some other organizations to do HIV AIDS practice work. Do they mention, we're gonna set aside some time and funds for you to make sure you and your staff will anticipate these ethical challenges. Is that, is that, does that happen? Um, no. Curious. <laughs> Chris. No, so really it does not. I think other than around confidentiality, it does not, which is, you know, a huge ethical issue. But um, as a matter of fact, this is something we're dealing with currently with a, a CDC uh, grant that we have is it's this, you know, I, I alluded to it earlier, this, this sense of, are we doing the right thing for the focused population community that we're working with versus the targets and goals that are, that are imposed on us? I mean, and, and the government has to impose some goals, um, but how do we build relationship in the community to do authentic work in that community while, knowing that we're going to lose our funding if we don't meet these numbers. So it's this constant battle of um, are we are we using the community, in, you know, and, and we're doing it to serve the community, but are we doing it in a way that's authentic to what their needs are? And um, there is no, not only no training around how we do that, but it's often contradictory to itself of you have to you have to get you know, you have to identify, I'm thinking that what we're doing is testing in the community for young black and Latin men, and you have to identify eight new positives in a year in order to maintain your funding. And if you don't do that, you're going to lose your funding. Uh, so there's this constant dynamic of getting out there in the community and getting those numbers at the same time as you want to build relationship in that community. And how do you do that in an ethical way that that meets the needs of the community authentically um, without feeling like you're, you're being a predator in that community. Um, some of that comes from long-term relationship in the community, but it, it's difficult and challenging and, and we're having some staffing issues around that as well. Uh, so that, that's, that's a real issue and, and our funders in all the years I've done this work, you know, other than any of the research work that I've done, I, I've not at all heard ethics be something that's brought up. I think it's implied in some ways. Uh, there are standards of care, there's there's mechanisms and ways of delivering services that have been pretty consistent for years, but it's not a part of the training that we receive. Other panelists, um, uh, do the funders pay attention to ethics? Do they allocate some funds, some resources, some training opportunities, so you and your staff are prepared to deal with these ethical issues in your work? I would say, I agree with Chris, it's not typically part of um, the funding, it's more part of the research side of it and the IRB side around some of the ethical issues. Um, but our team, because we have a model where we have uh, community health workers with a history of incarceration as part of both the research and the clinical side. Um, we've done a lot of our own work around ethical issues, so they're really well trained and prepared because they oftentimes in their day to day work are going to encounter people that they had a personal uh, relationship with in the past that now they're maybe having a professional relationship with in the clinic. Uh, and so 
kind of navigating some of those issues. We spend a lot of time preparing them for that and figuring out in each situation whether what makes the patient or participant most comfortable so that does, does having somebody who they was their cellmate you know 10 years ago um, make them feel more comfortable and they want to really interact with that person in a lot of cases yes and in some cases maybe they what they want to be able to talk about is really private and they would rather have somebody that they don't know at all. And so kind of figuring that out on a case by case basis. Um, but also at Sage Center, we also have a, uh, the center is really a partnership between the medical school and the law school. And so we also lean heavily on our partners in the law school. And we have um, law students as part of a medical legal partnership in our clinic to kind of address some of the legal and advocacy issues that come up as well. So it gives us a way to address those issues, but it doesn't necessarily have to be um, our team directly addressing them. We're connecting people to somebody who can help them kind of deal with some of those issues. And we often turn to our, our own colleagues to kind of figure out what to do within a particular case. Thank you. I Thank would. I would agree that we um, are often left on our own to decide what that means to do ethical research and practice. Um, with the federal funding process, I was just thinking about, okay, what's all required? And for my applications, because it specifically targets violence among couples, there is a lot of attention given to that because it's the focus of the proposal. But I wonder if it wasn't um, how much attention would be given to safety and probably more on the IRB side, as Joanna is saying. Um, and we come across too, so the standard trainings, like the city training, for example, is in English. So in working in Mozambique and a Portuguese speaking country, we come across issues like, do we, should we translate the city? Uh, does Portugal or Brazil have any trainings because Mozambique does not have a national ethics training program? Um, so there are issues there. And I'm just thinking through, um, you know, some of the things that we need to pay attention to in terms of participation. So I think Chris was mentioning this in his authenticity um, note, which comes up for us too. So if we want to do community partnered research and apply for federal funding, but have the research open ended enough and practice open ended enough where we're getting community input in an iterative way and making sure it's meaningful and relevant for communities. Uh, that's hard to write <laughs> an open-ended proposal um, for federal funding. It tends to have to be a little bit more structured. So there's some tension there too and how much we can be flexible in following community needs. Thank you. Um, I've seen a couple of questions, comments in the chat box. I definitely want to open it up to all of you. I don't want to be the only person asking questions, but just um, maybe one more um, question I have is um, partnership between researchers and practitioners, uh, civil society organization, et cetera, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in other countries. I'm curious, can that, inter can that partnership um, help uh, addressing some of the ethical challenges that come up in your work, um, both sides. Um, is that an essential component of making sure the ethical issues are understood, um, anticipated, acknowledged? Maybe Jen can start. I mean, I, when you're doing your research, I'm sure you're partnering with nonprofit organizations, civil society organization, Ministry of Health folks, clinicians. Um, does the ethical issues come up in those conversations and do you sort of come up with a plan how to tackle them? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say that is the, that's crucial. Um, these partnerships and getting input from how things are done in their communities. So I have a, an example of the, actually the first time that I went to Africa, I was a volunteer in Senegal in um, health education and working with malaria. And we were in a pretty remote place and in this village, no electricity, no running water. 
And there were all of these solar lamps lining this pathway to get to this village. And the lamps had been broken, there are rocks and glass everywhere, all of them had been broken. And I learned from this community that what had happened was an international organization had come to them with the idea that it would be really nice for them to have solar lamps to light their pathway for safety. And, uh, and it would be nice because they're solar and they installed them. But what had happened was there were, you know, malaria is the number one challenge, health challenge. So the solar lamps attracted all of these mosquitoes and posed additional challenge. And it was such a strong statement to me about community input and how like good intentions can uh, not be so good if they're not relevant for the community. And so we re rely very heavily on our partners to, to guide us in what's important. Um, as you know, I mentioned at the beginning of our call, I'm leaving for Mozambique tomorrow uh, to do this kind, exactly this kind of work because we are adapting an intervention to work with couples to reduce violence, to improve women's mental health. And a big part of that is around HIV status and disclosure. So thinking about, um, we did some focus groups specifically with women who were receiving HIV healthcare services about this potential intervention, you know, how can we do it? And something that came up a lot was, you know, I have not disclosed to my partner and my status and how could I work with this couple intervention if I haven't disclosed it? And that could really put me in trouble. So I go with not having any answers and we have all sorts of meetings and work groups set up with experts in the field and policymakers and anything that we adapt, we will take back to people in the community to get their input. So we try to um, just ask questions and receive as much participation as possible. Thank you for that. Um, other colleagues? I think that's a great example of a really good partnership. Um, I think what's important is that in researchers and um, service providing organizations working together, that one, you're talking to the right people. Uh, oftentimes folks will reach out to you know, me or to the more administrative folks and not the frontline folks. And that's where you're gonna really learn the most. Um, and that you're asking the questions and, and sincerely listening to the answers and not just coming in to, to use the community. And, and many times our, uh, our clients will look at a researcher coming in as using the community, you know, or it's an easy $25 gift card or something like that um, versus a real investment in listening to what they have to say. So I've seen it done really well and I've seen it not done really well. Um, I've seen it done in a way that's just sort of, well, we have to do this, so we're going to come in and we're gonna do this focus group, but we're going to leave with our predetermined answer. And, um, and, and clients can see right through that. The people we serve see right through that. We see right through that. Um, so I think it's, it's investing the time to come in and have a true partnership um, and, and that takes time. I think the, the biggest commitment to that is time. Yeah, I think having the input of many different groups is so important to the work. Uh, I know on our team, it's essential. Um, we have community health workers and research staff that, who have been incarcerated, uh, who are part of our team which is incredibly important as we think about some of these issues. We also have um, Dr. Wong and Dr. Puglisi and other people on our team are both clinicians and researchers. So they started out providing clinical care and now do a combination of uh, clinical care and research. And my own background, I was a social worker for 10 years before I came to research. So having those other perspectives is really important. And in social work, ethics is what we, I think, talk about all the time. Um, so that having that background has been hugely helpful in thinking about this. And I think as an example, when, um, when COVID started, we, in, we were of course really concerned about our patients in clinic and community members, but we also were really worried about the people who were inside. 
Uh, and that started a whole series of things that we did. So advocating for compassionate release for people who health put them at higher risk uh, for COVID inside. We did lots of advocacy around that. We partnered with um, other researchers to look at what was happening in facilities around COVID. We did uh, the, our community health workers trained uh, some of our patients to then go out into the community and talk to people about COVID and hand out masks and um, try to help get people vaccinated. Uh, and then we did had a research piece where we did um, we did both quantitative and qualitative work around COVID, interviewing um, uh, people who had been in, who were currently incarcerated and dealing with what was going on inside with COVID, as well as correctional staff. Um, to really try to come at the issue from a variety of perspectives. And so I think having all those different team members with different um, strengths and different experiences really enhances all of our work. Thanks for, thanks for that advice. Um, you brought up COVID and I wanna ask uh, this final question and then turn it over. Maybe Winnie can tell us what questions are in the chat box already. Um, has this pandemic kind of complicated the ethics of your work on the ground and how have you sort of tried to manage that? Has it, has it complicated some of the ethical issues? I can start um, for us, yes, very much. And again, cause we are primarily working, our main target is trying to reduce violence among couples. So now the main part of our research is in Mozambique. And um, now there's been a lot of media attention about the escalation of domestic violence and intimate partner violence during COVID. And uh, with everyone being quarantined in the home together, there's just more opportunity for it, but there's also you know, huge economic stressors, and especially where we're working in uh, these communities, um, people don't have very stable employment already. And so uh, there's been just a lot of pressure and stress on families. Services have um, adapted and I think have done a very good job of trying to be as mobile as possible and providing, you know, phone lines and things like that. But again, women might not have phones or um, uh, just their male partner has a phone, so they have to have permission to use it or they're trying to call and their partner is around. So certainly for us, it has exacerbated things and will be a big part of actually the work group and how we might respond to that going forward. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And especially, uh, for people who are very recently released, the transition to telemedicine was a huge challenge because many of our patients just coming out don't ha necessarily have a phone, don't have a place where they can sit down in, in a private place and have a, a telemed uh, telemedicine appointment. And so trying to deal with some of those issues was a huge challenge, trying to make sure that people got phones, that they could get connected, uh, to their providers was a real challenge during COVID, I would say. Yeah, and we've had similar situation. We, we bought uh, 65 tablets and data that we distributed to our clients and thought, well, there's a good solution. And many of the folks that we connected and who needed tablets who didn't have that kind of access had no idea how to use them. So, you know, after we did this, we realized we have to hire, um, we hired peers to work with them on the technology end of things to train them on some of the really things that, you know, we thought were simple, um, just how to get connected, how to turn the thing on, how to access apps, how to sign in, you know, that sort of thing. And, and that was really an unanticipated um, challenge for us. We thought, let's just provide them, you know, they don't have these things. That was our first challenge, but we didn't really think through the other parts until we got them out there. And then we came up with some solutions, but that didn't work for everyone. So 
um, there certainly was uh, inequality in, in distribution of technology. And, and I think um, that's, that's been huge uh, in our communities and, and looking at what we've learned through the pandemic is how do we get more connection out there to folks um, who needed that connection because they were so isolated already. Um, well, I could I could see how the pandemic has um, changed the priorities for the population. So, and also for the stakeholders. Let's say you're working with the Ministry of Health, or you're working with non-governmental organization, and now they're struggling with how to provide food and employment opportunities for their, uh, you know, customers who, because of COVID, has have lost a lot of things. So HIV AIDS may not be the top priority anymore, even though that may have been priority prior to COVID, but now they're like, oh, we have a lot more urgent things to take care of. And of course, I'm also thinking about my colleague, Rick Altis, who's been doing HIV AIDS work in um, Ukraine for 17 years. And now those individuals, both the patients, but also the caregivers, they're, situation has changed completely. So HIV AIDS, yes, it's still a concern, but there's so many other things that have come up for them. So it's, it's a struggle. Um, I'm gonna ask Winnie if you see a lot of questions in the chat box or if you can, and we wanna invite folks to, uh, there are not too many people so they can just um, open up their video and we can see them, they can ask their questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a few comments and a few uh, questions that were submitted ahead of time. And we definitely encourage participants as these conversations are unfolding to add any comments or additional questions. And uh, one of our first questions, we do have a question from Dr. Yurina Ranji. Um, and I will post it into the chat for everyone to see and then for Kaveh to read out loud. Actually, if you don't mind, read it. I'm not able okay. to read it. Oh, sorry. Okay, yes. Um, so from Dr. Uh, Dr. Ranji. I am collecting data among female sex workers in Nepal to understand their mobile use behavior in order to design a mobile-based intervention. While they are at high risk of HIV, their biggest concern during and after the pandemic is survival. What is our responsibility towards our participants in helping them survive and help them get basic needs such as food, medicine, clothing, and support for their children? How can we use our resources to help our participants with their basic needs? So we did a study, um, the WORTH study, which Kave mentioned at the beginning, that was focused on women who were recently released from, from prison. Um, and that study was an intervention that was facilitated by the community health worker on our team. And one of the things that was actually, we actually built into the project was part of it was her doing this group intervention with them, but also another aspect of it was that we connected them to the primary care clinic and then she was their community health worker. So we kind of built into the project that she was gonna help them with all these other needs that they had. And she might not have been able to do everything but she was making sure they got connected to places they could get food or um, whatever other substance use services, mental health services. She was making sure they got connected to those as part of the project. And I think when you're working with really vulnerable populations, I think you almost have to build that in. You can't just come and ask them. I mean, many of, the, many of these women were doing sex work. They were really vulnerable. They were in violent relationships. And so we had to ensure that they had their basic needs met and that they were receiving services. We couldn't just ask them to fill out a survey and go through a group and then just walk away from them. Um, and I think that's, we do have an ethical obligation when you're working, especially doing research in uh, communities that are very vulnerable that you can't just 
gather data and not provide them with any of the other things that they need. Yeah, I would agree with Joanna. Um, so not just you know giving them a list of resources, but talking with the organizations beforehand, explaining the research, telling them what you're going to do, and then connecting participants um, to those resources. Sometimes it can be a challenge, especially, I don't know where you're working in Nepal, if it's like a rural area, urban, but I think in rural areas, it can be somewhat more challenging. So resources might be available, but women might have to travel um, and might not have the money to do that, to access healthcare and things like that. So just thinking through, sometimes nonprofits will have some money for travel or provide transportation and thinking through beforehand what's all available and helping set that up if possible. Is it possible to reach back to the funders and say, look, because of COVID, there's some you know, very practical ethical issues and literally ask them for more support? Is that, is that something any of you have done? Whether it's a research funding or, or other funders, just go back and just tell them what's happening on the ground. Yeah, sometimes. You know, often often the funding can be so restrictive um, that there's not that opportunity, and sometimes there is. And there has been some flexibility built in around COVID, but you know, many times the funding is still relatively restrictive. Um, and we're looking forward to the next question around um, you know, given funding capacity and time restrictions, how do you prioritize what can be addressed? And unfortunately, it's many times not what is the greatest need or taking into consideration all the needs it's often where the where the funding is available um the, the money definitely often drives the services because without the money you can't provide the services other questions from the audience and you're welcome to ask the question yourself you want to just unmute yourself I just wanted to comment. Um, first of all, thank you all the panel. It's so great to hear all your different um, perspectives. I think COVID certainly has highlighted, you know, some of the stressors around how the changes in the environment shape our different projects. But, you know, as Gilda Radner used to say, it's always something, you know? So I think we should just plan ahead for, it's always, there's always gonna be something. And I think, you know, I think there's different types of grants and, you know, what Chris is describing at APNH, I mean, I don't know, that's so interesting to me, like just the, the, the mechanisms that fund this work and the ways in which they quantify success, you know, I really respect the, the boundaries that you're working within and I think it's an opportunity for us to advocate to these funders and tell them, you know, on behalf of APNH and other um, service, you know, providers that, you know, about, I don't know, to try to create more flexibility within that funding, but certainly within a research context, when we're talking about NIH grants and stuff, we have a, a, some flexibility in our budgets. And I think, you know, again, it's important for us as researchers to advocate through our grants to educate reviewers and to help them understand that we can't do 15 interviews in a day, you know? We can't say that we'll get through this and be able to do back to back. You know, sometimes even if we don't have money for housing and all these basic needs, if we can create space for people to talk about what they wanna talk about before we get to our questions, which I know adds more time, which, you know, but so I think there's ways that we, we can try to advocate with our funders to get the, the flexibility, whether it's in terms of staffing or some basic needs, some food stuff, some, you know, um, and just plan for it um, instead of being react, just plan for that something's gonna go wrong, that, that not something's gonna go wrong. Let, let's plan for the fact that life is always complicated when you're working with vulnerable people. Thanks for sharing that, Amy. Uh, Amy is another wonderful colleague and a social worker. 
there seems to be a lot of social worker on the that with us today. And I know Amy, you were also worked quite a bit with uh, incarcerated population, women mostly. And you may have also encountered some ethical issues. If you have questions or insights you want to provide, feel free. All right, I see other question. Um, anybody has a question, go ahead and ask. Or maybe we need, you can, you can read it. Yep, yep. so, oh. Um, Raise their hand, go ahead, Josiane. Hi, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I'm having uh, internet issues. So We can hear you well. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, um, for this information. Um, I'm, I'm curious, so I'm working with a local health district um, to enhance the Department of Public Health um, emergency preparedness process for um, for vulnerable populations in, here in Connecticut. And I'm curious to know what ethical issues you have all seen in, in regards to like um, information sharing and, confi um, and like confidentiality concerns. Because um, that's something uh, I'm encountering a lot. How do you ensure that information in an ethical way, information it gets to the, you know, gets to the proper people in need. Thank you for that great question. Any of the panelists would like to share thoughts? Well, I would say we see this issue a lot, um, especially from probation and parole, wanting information on how someone is doing, whether they're attending programs, um, whether they're coming to clinic, uh, and we have a policy, we're not going to provide any information to any outside source unless the, per, the participant or the patient um, says that we're able to do that. Sometimes they want us to, so for example, we had one patient who was having some issues with probation and we had them working with uh, a psychologist. And so they set it up so that they wanted um, to meet regularly with the psychologist and the probation officer as a way to kind of help the probation officer see what was going on with them. And they weren't divulging all of the things that they talked about, but it was an opportunity to uh, work with probation and make it clear to them that this person was kind of working on many of these issues that they were dealing with. But in some cases, patients don't want any information disclosed. And so we're not gonna disclose it uh, and our first priority is really to the participant or the patient. And so sometimes you have situations where people are um, in need of some kind of mental health treatment or substance use treatment and uh, parole feels like they need to be put back inside. Well, my first priority is to advocate for them to be in treatment, but we've had people who were in the Yale Psychiatric Hospital and parole went and pulled them out and put them back inside. And so these are some of the things that we kind of deal with on a regular basis. And I think ensuring that whatever you're doing is what the patient or participant wants is key to dealing with some of those problems. We have a little bit of a different setup, but in Mozambique, we're working within the healthcare system already, the public healthcare system. So you know, similar to a medical record, we also do not share any information with anyone, including um, not forcing women to report any abuse or domestic violence uh, could get them in more trouble. So it's really the patient's lead for us. Same for us. Go ahead, Muni. I see you have a comment you want to read. Yes. So this comment is from Humphrey, who asked me to read this out loud due to on-network connection. So 
Uh, he commented this a little while ago. So he said, thank you very much for the discussions on the critical areas regarding HIV. Uh, Humphrey is based in Uganda uh, where they mentioned that the prevalence of HIV is still high. And they discussed that there has not been enough training regarding human ethics and HIV care and management. Very few researchers are trained and a majority of healthcare providers are not trained. And I would specifically like to address this to Dr. Moots to um, respond to. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there are very few resources. Um, and just preparing for today in the panel, uh, because I'm more familiar with gender-based violence resources and ethical training, I wonder, you know, what is available? And there's just not that much. And so making it more systematic so that it doesn't just fall on the researcher or programming, um, you know, whatever they feel is important to them. And I think providing some standards, especially globally, will be really helpful. So potentially through the World Health Organization um, or some kind of institution like that. We can, Humphrey, we can write and start a working group. And thank you again for that comment, Humphrey. Are there other questions, Minnie? Do you see? Yep. Um, Gabriel has a question. And uh, Gabriel, if you would like to unmute, please do so. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. This is uh, Gabe Colbert in Chicago. I work with uh, prison populations. And a couple of issues that have come up unrelated is one is there just seems to be a real sort of emphasis in funding agencies on, on technology solutions, M Health mobile tablets, you know, uh, and that, you know, as, as Dr. Cole pointed out, that that's often those technologies are, are, are in some cases, uh, you know, it's, those are new technologies for the people in our target setting. And I feel like I've been getting pushback on more um, sort of um, home, I don't know what to call them, basic time honored interventions like um, home visits um that are maybe less uh technological um and and the feedback i've been getting is oh this looks really resource intensive you know it looks like it requires nurses to go out and visit people in their homes and it's like uh yeah that's what we've been doing for 100 years and it works really well and i feel like um i feel like there's a real emphasis on technology and it seems to be a very western kind of value um you know social media, uh, you know, it's like all these things represent kind of, uh, these are all things that Westerners are kind of fascinated with. And they think that they are, they bring a promise to some of these thorny problems that we've been dealing with for so long. But I, I just think there's an ethical issue embedded in that with our embrace of technology. <clears throat> That's the first issue. And then the second issue is to my chagrin, I, I, I heard a story recently that certificates of confidentiality are enforced by the university, which means it's essentially up to the university lawyers to decide if they're going to enforce a COC against a judge or a plaintiff uh, who issues a subpoena. So once the subpoenas are received by the university, the university's lawyers have to decide if they're actually going to commit resources to enforce this. And sometimes they don't. And at that point, Health and Human Services sort of throws up their hands and says, well, it's up to your university. So those are a couple issues I've run into. Thank you, Gabrielle. Our panelists, any response to Gabrielle's questions or comments? Well, I would say thank you for bringing up. Those are really important issues. I, I'm actually in the process of writing up something around technology um, and its increasing use in research. And I think it really does leave out groups of people who are not um, savvy in using the technology. And as Chris said, we also have lots of people who just, even if you give them the phone, they don't know how to use it. If you've been in prison for 30 years, you've never had a cell phone before. And so there is a bit of a learning curve for you to get familiar with it and accustomed to it. And so if you do want to use technology in your work, then you have to build in kind of um, some training around that. Um, but I think with 
you know, I, we don't have to only use these technological um, resources. Everything doesn't have to be on an app. Uh, the study we did with women involved an app, but it was done in a group with the community health worker present. And she was kind of guiding participants through using the app and they were having a discussion at the same time. Um, because also if you're not used to using technology, I think it's very difficult to engage someone in using an app, even if you teach them how to use it, are they gonna consistently turn to it and pick it up and kind of move through the intervention, I think is really challenging. Um, so thank you for that point. I think it's it's interesting that you bring this up. So um, we actually just had a couple of grants funded to do just what you're saying and use technology to reach youth through HIV services in New York City. Uh, and it's very formative work. So it is about like, do people have access? How can we make this technology relevant? So maybe in the form of video games and meant to supplement um, provider services but the whole premise of these applications and grants is to provide additional access, especially in you know, a place like New York City where there, it's been very difficult to get mental health care. And so uh, even with referrals, people don't follow up, especially youth, adolescents and young adults. So maybe the idea is that potentially this could bridge the gap. But I would say you know, this sort of speaks to funding priorities as well. These, um, Grants have been easier to get than, than others. And I think that's you know, the whole point. And we don't know yet if it really will work and will be relevant for the populations with whom we're working, but hopefully we'll find out in a couple of years. Other questions from the audience? Okay, there was a question of, from Gabe Colbert about the certificate of confidentiality. I don't know if you or others would like to address that. My understanding is if you, well, in the past, if you're going to be doing research um, on very sensitive topics, uh, substance use, et cetera, you were expected to get a certificate of confidentiality from NIH. Um, to give you extra protection, but I'm not sure if, if that has changed. Sounds like what I just heard from Gabrielle, that situation has changed. It's, did well, you say that the universities uh, do that? No, what, what, that happen, what happens is Department of Health and Human Services issues the COC. Okay. Now that you have it in hand, you hold it and hope that a judge doesn't subpoena your data. Once the judge subpoenas your data, you have, it, you, have to, you have to enforce the COC. Enforcement comes from the local attorneys at the university. Mm -hmm. So their, their attorneys will review it and they will decide, do we want to commit resources to enforce this COC? And at least in one case at my university, they have said, no, uh, it's a little opaque why, why they declined to, to enforce that. But the issue was the researcher had to appear before a judge. Uh, the lawyers from the university uh, didn't enforce the COC and the researcher had to turn over data to a judge to show that a, a plaintiff was at the community location as her alibi. So I was disappointed to know that enforcement is left to the university. Mm -hmm. These things are rarely challenged. And so one might not know this unless it's challenged, but I used to walk around with my certificate like I was bulletproof, and that is just not true. Mm -hmm. And how do you explain that to the to your study participant? You say we are we are we are obtaining a certificate of confidentiality, but it is not. Sounds like it's not going to one hundred percent prevent us from being forced to share some of your data with law enforcement or well, judges. One thing I'm curious about is if, if is this an isolated case or are there other instances in the U.S. of this happening? And if so, on balance, how often are these things actually enforceable? I have the I, same perspective that you had, that if you, if you get a certificate of confidentiality, it's very, very unlikely 
that a judge will push you to release data that you co collect as part of your research. Um, that just by showing that certificate of confidentiality kind of closes the door, but sounds like it, things may have been changing. So that's an interesting point, and I hope uh, you and others may want to write about this, put it out there, because that's that's not something I had thought about, frankly. I thought the COC kind of protects participants' data and prevents from researchers being forced to release any data. I, I thought so too which is why I'm curious. Okay. Yeah, I think it's an important conversation because I think many of us thought that was the case, that it did protect our data. And if it doesn't, then we need to know that and we need to be able to voice that to participants. Um, so far that hasn't come up for us, but it's a bit scary that you might be forced to, to turn over your, your data. Well, I think, and I'm gonna do this myself, I think it's a worth a conversation preemptively or proactively with the attorneys. Introduce yourself as a PI with a COC and say, what's, what's, what should I expect if, uh, this, if my data is subpoenaed? Where do you all stand on these things? Uh, I'd like to know before I start recruiting. And if any of you learn anything, I'd, I'd be super interested in hearing from you or through Dini, you know, what, what you learn. I know this doesn't apply outside the US, but. Right, so it's a confidentiality is very much a domestic issue, but right. and now that you brought this up, I think I'm gonna reach out to the chair of our IRB and ask that very same question and see uh, if there's something going on. And they, they should release that information to the investigators so they're aware if there's any limitation to the protection that's gained from us getting a CUC. We have a little bit more time if there are other questions uh, from the audience. Um, as we're waiting, I actually have a, a question. Wait, so, yeah, so one of the things that you know, um, I think also Dr. Smoyer had brought up, right? It's hard to know what the right thing is. And I think our conversation today has spent uh, a lot on, you know, the leading up trying to ensure that we're doing the right thing. But I think it's important that we acknowledge that sometimes we don't make that mark and that damages community trust, that damages trust with individuals. And I'm curious from the three of you about, you know, what happens when something does go wrong? Like, how do we incorporate accountability? How do we seek to, you know, uh, really try to repair those relationships while also, you know, acknowledge, not trying to sidestep that damage. Um, it's imperative that we realize that we're not always gonna get this right. I would say for us, it's about, I mean, the first thing I think is, you know, when you have power and privilege, uh, like many of us do, um, it's really important to pay attention to that in the relationships with team members and how that's structured. So it could be sometimes with that comes like a blind spot um, and actually very often comes with a blind spot. So opening communication in a way and providing a safe environment where people feel free to give feedback to one another and talk about issues that might arise. Um, that's really important. And we've tried to do that in different settings, um, but what has come up for us, and I don't think we have the answer still, um, is about like communication and cross-cultural communication, and especially around direct feedback. So, you know, coming from New York, people are very direct about what they like and don't like, and they feel very free to, to say that whether you, you ask or not. Um, but in many settings where we're working are quite hierarchical and um, getting that feedback can be more challenging. So the first time I went to Uganda, we had built in this whole, how, are, how am I gonna get feedback? And um, with the, I'll work with the translator who can say, you know, if I, make any you know cultural errors or anything like that and he can let me know and that will help me learn and uh, he did not 
didn't say anything. And I was asking very directly uh, and realized after, only after that this is really about communication. Like this, this kind of communication would never happen in that setting. I was considered his superior and he would not provide direct feedback about mistakes that I was making. Um, this still comes up for us in research in Mozambique because we do implementation research. So we ask healthcare providers about, you know, how is this program going? Do you like it? What don't you like about it? And we often will hear like, everything is fantastic. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I love the intervention. I'm going to implement it 100%. And it's only later through qualitative methods that we can get more of a detailed picture and also being um, very specific about that this, this feedback will help us. We want to improve programming um, and letting people know on the team too that this is really helpful for us and it's good for us to know if something happens so that we can address it. I think too, the, and Jennifer spoke a bit about this, but the having the input of multiple different people when you're trying to make decisions about these things is really helpful because something I might not think is an issue somebody else can bring up. Um, and also just being willing to go back and say, I'm sorry, I messed this up. I mean, we have to be, be accountable for when we do make mistakes and saying, you know, taking responsibility for that and really being open about it and how you getting feedback on how you can be better the next time. I got one more question to ask, um, you know, conducting research on sensitive topics such as HIV AIDS or gender based violence and substance use. Uh, and the public health community, we like to think that if we collect data and evidence and put it out there, good things will happen. That government agencies and a nonprofit humanitarian organization will all jump in and say, thanks for this data. Now we know what the problems are. We're gonna address it. But unfortunately, that scenario doesn't always work that way. You may put out uh, information out there that HIV AIDS or substance use is high in this community, in this city, and bad things can happen. There may be a pushback, or let's say you're working with refugee populations and you show that they have, some of them have substance use problems, some of them have HIV AIDS. It could literally provide evidence for people who've been trying to push them out of the country to say, oh, they're bringing drugs into this country, they're bringing HIV into this country, let's get rid of them. So as researchers, when you think about disseminating your findings, are there any ways you can anticipate some of these ethical challenges where instead of benefiting the participants, unfortunately, sometimes not because of what, because of you, but because of the situation, the political nature of these, sometimes your evidence may be used against those uh, participants and their community. Is this something you've thought about or you've encountered and if you have any examples to share, I would appreciate that. So as a quick example, I did a study that was interviewing men who had been released about their healthcare during incarceration. And many of them talked about really um, horrible things that had happened to them and a real lack of care that they received and when they did have serious health problems and also seeing people around them get really sick and die because they weren't getting treatment. Uh, and so in writing up that article, I had to be really careful to make sure that I wasn't gonna reveal anybody's identity in sharing some of the quotes that they had. And so making sure certain pieces of the quotes were left out, that there were no, um, nothing that could kind of lead back to the person because it could have real, have real implications for them if they did end up back in a facility and the person somehow knew that they were the ones that had participated in the study and said these negative things about the healthcare they received, it might result in them um, receiving some retribution or not receiving care. Oh, 
Well, Kaveh, you know, we've thought a little bit about this. We wrote an article uh, about dissemination. Um, so in thinking about gender-based violence and researching gender-based violence, an issue that's come up for us is around, um, you know, ma potentially masking the purpose of a survey for the community because we didn't want male partners to suspect that women might be talking about violence in the homes. And then when it came time to distribute that information and provide information back to the community, we sort of got ourselves stuck because we wanted to do that at a community-based level to make sure that the women at a population-based level, so the women who participated would um, be able to hear the results of those findings. But in consultation with local partners, um, you know, they thought that that would be too risky, especially because we provided, um, we facilitated a survey. And then for women exposed to armed conflict and intimate partner violence, we randomly selected women and followed up with interviews. So they could be identifiable. So that posed some troubles for us. So now what we're building into the research is if we would like to disseminate the findings, talking with participants during the research process of how they would like to hear about it and if they have recommendations for us. That makes so much sense to me. Um, yes. Winnie, I know we, we are getting ready to complete, but go ahead. Yes, uh, we have one more question from Dr. Jolly that I really would like um, for us to address. And uh, Dr. Jolly, if you could unmute, please. Yes, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, it's really been very uh, insightful and, and um, really useful for my work. So I've asked you, how do you reckon with your own positionality um, and often whiteness and or Americanness in both research and your everyday interactions with participants and clients in those spaces, especially in majority Black contexts, which a lot of us know are facing colonial and imperial legacies of inequality, quality violence, armed conflict slash war. Um, and it's also coming from my own space as an HIV AIDS researcher with Black women um, who's navigated spaces in Jamaica, Uganda, and in Brooklyn, and just getting an understanding of how my insider-outsider perspective certainly facilitates access in certain contexts and undermines it in others, and it certainly shapes the sort of thinking around ethics. So I welcome your thoughts um, about that, your own positionality and what that means. Um, well, I can answer some. So I think this is a really important question and sort of speaks to the power, power dynamics that I was alluding to earlier in research teams, especially coming from a high income setting, being white, um, you know, highly educated. There's all sorts of privileges that come with the work. Uh, in particular, I think funding is a big one and the direction of that funding, who holds it, what is the flow of that? So um, I worked with, in Uganda, my uh, secondary mentor, and Kave was my primary mentor, and I had a secondary mentor in the Department of Women and Gender Studies. And we talked a lot about this, mostly from a transnational feminist perspective, and just thinking through, you know, also what are our blind spots? Like, it, what, it's not enough to collaborate um, and try to get input and have cultural humility from, you know, my partner, who's an academic, and at the university, she and I might have some shared positioning, actually being academics, um, feminist academics that might differ from populations both in the US and in Uganda. So really considering that intersectionality, how it plays out in power dynamics and making sure you know, whose voices are heard, whose voices are not represented within that lens and making sure to include voices who might not be represented. Yeah, I think that's it's a hugely important question. Um, I come to the work as a Black woman, but I don't necessarily appear to be Black to people that encounter me. So the way they receive me is going to be totally different from the way they might receive someone else. Um, and I have a lot of shared uh, things in common from my history with many of my participants. But and many people close to really close to me have been incarcerated, but I myself have never been incarcerated. And so I have to um, take that into consideration as well. So in that study I just mentioned, I did the qualitative interviews, I actually trained men who had been incarcerated to do the interviews. 
and I did it with them, but they took the lead and I kind of just jumped in if I needed to probe on certain things because I did feel it was important that the participants saw themselves in the research team and saw that um, these men that had been in the same place they were, were now interviewing them and taking the lead on this work. And they designed the questions, um, which I thought was really important in thinking about what language we were using. So I think there's lots of things you can do to ensure that um, when you do the res this research that uh, there, everyone's voices are heard and part of the project. And it's not just coming from me because even though I have some similarities with many of my participants, I have many privileges that they don't have and will probably never have. And so I have to remember that and I have to bring in people who can point out to me and make sure that we're doing the right thing and asking the right questions. Thank you all so much. I know we've reached the end of our uh, session. I'll ask Mini if you have any last minute um, things to mention. I really want to thank all the panelists. It's been an unbelievably reflective, thoughtful conversation on a Monday morning. So I think we're all going to be processing this for hours and hours and days. Um, Winnie, is, is there any last minute things you want to bring up? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'd like to echo what Dr. Kushner has mentioned. This has been an incredibly great way to start the morning and the week. Um, and we certainly do not want this conversation to end here. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists. I would like to plug our um, upcoming workshop, um, which is functioning as an extension of this panel. It also addresses ethics in uh, HIV research, in particular uh, for humanitarian settings. I just dropped the call for applications link. Um, the application is due this Friday, although we are probably planning on extending that application. We would love to see as many of you here as possible. Many of the questions that you brought up are excellent for exploring further in that space. Um, we will be joined by Dr. Kushnud, as well as two of our other colleagues, uh, Dr. Luke Davis and Dr. Stephen Latham, who have uh, backgrounds in addressing bioethics as well as HIV and other infectious diseases. And if you really enjoyed this panel, you will you know, get a chance to further discuss your own research and your own specific questions at that workshop uh, with other people. Um, so we please, please, please would love to see you there. And um, you'll see Dina and I again as an extra little bonus. Um, and yes, and uh, Dini has dropped a evaluation survey um, in our group chat, we absolutely would love to hear from you about um, how you found this event. Um, and yes, uh, they will also be shared by email. Uh, that is all from me, unless Jeannie and Kave have any further last minute things. But uh, thank you again for spending part of your day with us. Um, and thank you again so much to our amazing panelists for sharing their insights. Um, this has been truly an incredible conversation that I hope we continue to have. Thank you all. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody.